happy Saturday, everybody. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, somebody asked on Twitter whether we would think about doing a podcast on the Astor Place Riot. Well, good news. Previous hosts have already done that for you. So we are going to share that one today. This originally came out January 5th, 2011 from previous hosts, Sarah and Dublina. Enjoy. Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Sarah Dowdy. And I'm Dublina Chakrabordy. And a while ago, in fact, right around Halloween, Katie and I talked about the Macbeth curse, which is a pretty interesting, spooky subject. Yes, it is. And I mean, there are lots of incidents of the Macbeth, the supposed Macbeth curse. But one that we mentioned was the Astor Place riot. And it's considered the worst, most violent theatrical riot in American history. And I thought about it again recently after reading Dan Simmons' book, Drood. And um, in it, William Charles McCready is actually a character, and the story of this riot is recounted, and it kind of piqued my interest. Yeah, it has a lot of bizarre elements in it. We're going to look at theater history a little bit, the lives of these two famous actors who were sort of opposites, and British-American foreign relations in the 1800s, and the early American class tensions, and even some Tammany Hall politics. But the best part of it, we're looking at all of that in the context of a riot. So, I mean, (laughs) it's pretty exciting. And um, I guess just to kick us off, we'll go through our playbill and introduce the two main players in this drama. One is a British intellectual, and the other is a rugged American. Right. Well, the British intellectual is William Charles McCready. And in 1849, May of that year, actually, he was in the United States to perform a farewell engagement at Manhattan's finest theater, which was the Astor Place Opera House. McCready at this time was considered an intellectual actor, but one with a lot of intensity. And despite his aristocratic reputation and popularity with the finer sorts, finer classes, he had gotten into acting because he didn't have enough money to go to law school. Yeah, so he he had a humble element to his origins, which is conveniently forgotten later in this podcast. But at this point, McCready was far along in his theatrical career. He's 56 years old. I mean, after all, this is his farewell tour. Mm -hmm. And he's a huge success. He would played every major role. Uh, He debuted as Romeo. He played Hamlet, Iago, Lear, Othello, Richard III, but he was most famous for his Macbeth. It was his signature role. And he's also known for his decided ideas about how theater should be done while managing two of London's finest theaters, Drury Lane and Covent Garden. McCready was able to establish new expectations for productions, so he introduced things that were kind of revolutionary at the time. Actors would rehearse together, which seems obvious nowadays, but I guess they used to rehearse individually before. Yeah, at the time, I almost feel like a play was more about going to see the big soliloquies with your favorite stars, and so they would learn their lines in private and interpret them however they wanted and then come together, and you have to imagine the end product would be sort of a mishmash. Right. So McCready changed that and he made it more similar to what it is today. People were rehearsing together. He also wanted the costumes to be more historically accurate and the sets and props would complement the plays. And probably most importantly, he revolutionized the way that Shakespeare was performed because up until this point, they would perform corrupted versions of these what seemed to us uh, um, like plays you could never touch, you know, why would you want to mess with Shakespeare? Right. But at the time, uh, like King Lear had a happy ending, 150 years of King Lear with a happy ending. I don't really see the point. I don't even know how you do that. I I know. (laughs) But I guess McCready didn't see the point of something like that either. And so at his houses, when they did Shakespeare, they would do Shakespeare. It might be shortened, but it wouldn't be a corrupted version. Yeah, and in the United States, there were also some major shakeups going on in the way Shakespeare was performed at that time as well. And it was all because of a guy named Edwin Forrest, who is an actor 13 years McCready's junior and a protege of Edmund Keane, who is regarded generally as the greatest English actor of his time. And Forrest's emotionally intense frank performance of Othello in New York City in 1826 had made his name. And like McCready, he also brought that same intensity to his roles. And 
rugged good looks helped him as well a little bit. Yeah, he was very all-American, and uh, it ultimately made him a hero of the Shakespeare-loving working classes, which at the time, everybody loved Shakespeare. I mean, it was common reading. It was common for working-class people to have Shakespeare partially memorized and to entertain each other by reciting soliloquies. Um, But just because Forrest has impressed a large part of the American theater-going population, some of the critics were less impressed. And the New York Tribune critic William Winter writes this really (laughs) scathing commentary and calls Forrest quote, a vast animal bewildered by a grain of genius. (laughs) That was harsh. Cutting William Winter. Definitely. Well, one thing, there was something that the two men had in common, the British and the American. They both had an interest in national playwrights. I mean, we think of 19th century British literature as a time of great novels, but McCready really wanted people to focus on plays. So he was encouraging writers of his time in his country to write more plays and get out there and focus on that. Forrest, meanwhile, set up a contest for the writing of American plays, and he gets some that he likes. John Augustus Stone's Metamora and Robert Montgomery Byrd's Gladiator, which was considered the beginning of native homegrown American drama. Yeah, and Forrest's ideal out of all of this was to have American theater free itself from English plays. I mean, I'm sure he didn't entirely want to do away (laughs) with someone like Shakespeare, but really have its own identity. So it's easy to see where this is going. It's easy to see how a professional rivalry between two men of such great stature in their own countries would develop. And they did become professional rivals. And the rift apparently stemmed from Forrest's tour of England in the 1830s. He hissed during one of McCready's London plays. So and, rude. Yeah, it was very rude. And um, some accounts said that that was due to a misunderstanding. But I never found anything that provided further explanation than that. And I have a hard time imagining how you would accidentally hiss someone at a play. And Forrest pretty much defended his actions. So all McCready was left to do was pretty much dismiss the whole thing. And he also wrote about how annoying and trivial this whole situation was in his diaries. So he didn't really strike back per se, but he definitely expressed his displeasure. Yeah, we we can imagine Forrest saying, I have a right to hiss him if I want. (laughs) Well, McCready is just so annoyed by the whole the whole story and anything taking attention away from what's really going on. Yep, the play. Yeah, but Forrest's followers were really devoted to him, and they saw McCready's style as um, not emotionally intense enough. It was intellectual and cold. It wasn't their cup of tea. And so this back-and-forth feud begins between the followers of these two men, and it could be anything from— um, Forrest's followers causing trouble, you know, causing disturbances at McCready's plays, hissing or catcalling, to um, McCready's followers making sure that the finest London literary society was closed to Forrest. So just uh, getting at each other, the followers just bickering back and forth for years. <laughs> There's more to it than just the acting aspect, too. It was also about what the men stood for. And we've mentioned a little bit of that. It was the obvious national breakdown, McCready being English, Forrest being American. It's the 1840s, but there are still some Anglo-American tensions left over from the American Revolution and the War of 1812. So that stuff hadn't entirely disappeared. Yeah, that's hanging over over this whole story. But it's also about class. And McCready is the favorite actor of the elite and the New York aristocracy that just love everything about English society. And according to the theater professor Bruce McConaughey, the forest propaganda actually called McCready the pet of princes, which is (laughs) – That's pretty cruel, isn't it? Yes. Um, Whereas Forrest had this bold style and these Tammany Hall connections, and he's, of course, the favorite of the working man. So it's a a class division. Yeah. And, I mean, I think it was put well by Forrest biographer Richard A. Moody. He said, no other actor could 
churn up the emotions of the American audiences as Forrest did with his stormy kind of renderings of Shakespeare's tragic heroes or his passionate patriotic impersonation of any one of a half dozen freedom-loving zealots struggling against tyrannical oppression. So kind of a long quote, but I think it expresses the way working class people identified with Forrest. Yeah, it expresses Forrest's effect on them, mm-hmm. too. Um, so clearly more is at stake than who's your favorite actor. And the newspapers label this rivalry the rich against the poor. So we can see where this is going. Definitely fueling it. So you'd think that promoters wouldn't go looking for trouble in this heated scenario by staging these two men playing the same role in the same city on the same night. But that's exactly what ends up happening. Yeah. So in early May 1849, there are two placards all over New York City. One advertises McCready at the Astor Place Opera House playing Macbeth. The other advertises Forrest at the Broadway Theater, again, playing Macbeth. (laughs) Um, But the managers are hoping, they're not expecting a riot to come out of this. They're just hoping that they'll sell all their tickets and pack their houses and maybe people get a little stirred up. Yeah, I mean, I can see that logic too, but they start to realize that that's not necessarily the case when a manager for Astor Place goes out and gives away some free tickets on May 7th, 1849, the day of the show. And when he returns to the opera house, he finds out that most of them have already been snatched up. He suspects that It wasn't all McCready fans who wanted these tickets he was giving away. Yeah, he's smelling trouble here. And so he asked the chief of police for protection at the show, just in case anything goes down. (laughs) Um, So it's the afternoon of the play, and the crowd starts building in front of the theater long before the doors are set to open. And when they finally do open, there's just a rush to get in. And I can imagine going in the doors if you're a regular theater goer at this time and looking around. It's not the normal crowd for Astor Place. The regulars are in their boxes, but the floor is packed with these tough-looking men, and some are wearing shirt sleeves of, you know, horrors, (laughs) and all of them are wearing their hats indoors. And it seems like, I mean, that would be menacing, something is up. Something's going to happen. But they're all quiet and they're patient. They're just waiting. But they're also obviously communicating with each other with these secret signals. Perhaps jokes. Yeah, some jokes get thrown around. Um, so it, it's um, something's going to happen. Right. So then we have showtime. At about 7.30 when the play is about to start, they start stomping. It, it's something called a tramp warning. Normally it would die off, but in this case it starts to get louder. The theater and its chandeliers start to shake. Yeah, and when the play goes on, there are cheers from the boxes from these regular theater goers, these regular McCready fans. <laughs> but there are hisses and cat calls and cock crows from everyone else. I'm kind of imagining different versions of the arrest development cock crow. But, <laughs> um, McCready is drowned out when he tries to start speaking his lines. And he he reacts pretty impressively to this, I would say. At first, he just folds his arms and he waits, you know, expecting that people start to get a little embarrassed and maybe it'll die out. Yeah, they can't keep it up forever, yeah, right? he'll be able to continue his performance. Then he stalks the stage in front of the footlights. And I mean, this is a man who sort of got his start playing villains, um, melodramatic villains. So I imagine (laughs) he's got a great face, a great villainous face. And I imagine he's throwing it at the crowd as he stalks the footlights. And then finally, he just tries to outshout them. And he gets partway through the act that way, even though nobody can hear him. The cries are completely drowning him out. Poor Lady Macbeth enters, and people shout obscenities at her, so she basically flees the stage. Yeah, it's just getting worse and worse instead of getting better. People thought maybe if a lady was on stage, the crowd might have a little more respect. Right. But that's not quite what happens. Actually, projectiles start coming at the stage at that point. First, potatoes, then rotten eggs, then a chair at McCready's head. According to Joel Tyler Heedley's 1873 account, someone shouts, Go off the stage, you English fool. Who? Three cheers for Ned Forrest. 
Yeah. And then another chair comes. Oh, gosh. And so at this point, McCready is worried he will be killed. And this will be his final tour and his final performance of Macbeth. So he leaves the stage and the curtain comes down. And uh, that seems like it should have been the end of this story. Unfortunately, it's not. Um, Theater riots weren't terribly uncommon during this time. People would riot over things like, I thought the play was bad or I thought the music was bad. Um, But this was going pretty far, and McCready certainly thought so. And he resolved to cancel the engagement, go back to England on the next ship. But his American friends convinced him otherwise. Yeah, they actually published a petition about it. They um, published this. It said, to W.C. McCready, Esquire, Dear Sir, the undersigned, having heard that the outrage at the Astor Place Opera House on Monday evening is likely to have the effect of preventing you from continuing your performances and from concluding your intended farewell engagement on the American stage, take this public method of requesting you to reconsider your decision and of assuring you that the good sense and respect for order prevailing in this community will sustain you on the subsequent nights of your performances. So, pretty strong recommendation to stay or please. We're going to back you was. up. Yep, exactly. Forty-seven people signed this, among them Washington Irving and Herman Melville. And so McCready agrees. I mean, if Washington Irving and Herman Melville ask you to do something, you, you pay attention. Letter. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> So he decides he'll perform May 10th, the same play again at Astor Place. Yeah, but as soon as the placards go up to advertise this return of the McCready engagement, other placards appear. And these ones are advertising Forrest playing the character of the gladiator in the Broadway theater on the same night. Now that we know about gladiators, I'm wondering if he had to put on a little bulk up bulk a little for bit. that one. <laughs> um, but there's another placard that goes up too. And this one is a lot more dangerous. It's, I mean, this is in all caps. You can actually see this placard. Maybe I'll post it on Twitter or Facebook. Um, but it says, Working men, shall Americans or English rule in this city? The crew of the British steamer have threatened all Americans who shall dare to offer their opinions this night at the English aristocratic opera house. Working men, free men, stand up to your lawful rights. So, Pretty serious. They're insinuating that if you go protest at the McCready performance, English sailors will attack you. I mean, that's, that's yeah. I that's mean, strong stuff. Before people assumed maybe it might go off. Okay, this time there was no question. It's going to make people angry reading that. And there's going to be trouble. And so, in this case, the police are already plugged in. They're they're expecting some sort of trouble to go down this time. And they're actually already inside of the Astor Place Opera House when the doors open. And so when the doors open, instead of this crowd rushing in, um, only ticket holders are allowed. Um, a few ruffians still get in to make a little trouble. But then the theater is locked. It's barricaded. The windows are all barricaded. And everything is readied for the show. Um, still, some of the people who made it in start their tramp warning. And I just, I can't imagine why you would go to this play. <laughs> imagine being locked and barricaded inside the theater. Yeah, you'd have to be a big fan. You would have to be a super fan, a I major. Guess. I mean, it was his final tour, I guess. So there's motivation to go and the Maybe petition and everything. Be killed at the theater. <laughs> be killed at the theater, yes. Death by theater. But... The crowd, worse than the crowd inside and the few that had gotten in, the crowd outside was the part that's really intimidating. It had gotten enormous. Some estimates put it at about 10,000 to 15,000 people. And they knocked out the street lamps. They threw stones. They tried to break down the doors. Um, and the police actually had to start worrying about an actual attack on McCready. Yeah, it seemed like there would be an attack from the few people inside. And once they saw signs that an attack might be made, that they might try to snatch him off the stage, they started arresting a few of the rioters who were inside the theater. And supposedly this further incites the people outside if they get wind of this. But after a time, and McCready continues to act, after a time he leaves the stage, 
He sneaks out through a private door, supposedly disguised as an officer on horseback, and escapes back to his hotel with friends, um, gets out of it before it gets any worse. So the performance is over, basically. Then the militia has to arrive. The rioters rush at the cavalry, driving them into retreat. The infantry is battered by stones, and eventually it seems like they're going to have to retreat or fire at yeah. the crowd. And there, we should say, too, there are all of these paving stones ready because there's a construction site nearby. So it's like unlimited projectiles <laughs> for the rioters, conveniently enough. But yeah, eventually, Commanding Officer Major General Charles Sanford gives the order to charge bayonet. But because the uh, troops and the crowd are in such close quarters, there's no room to charge. So some of the crowd actually sees the soldiers' muskets. And there are repeated warnings. Nobody really wants to open fire on this crowd. Um, Repeated warnings to disperse or they'll have to shoot. Finally, the sheriff gives the order to fire blanks over the crowd's head. Because they realize they're blanks and they're going over their heads, it only incites ridicule from the crowd. I know. Um, which is unfortunate. And then finally, the order is given to fire point blank, but low so that the men will be injured, not killed. And um, it's it's not just that the orders are – the um, people in charge are reluctant to give the orders. The men are reluctant to carry them out. They don't feel right shooting um, a civilian point blank in their own city. Yeah, which makes sense, definitely. It wasn't something that they wanted to do, but in the end, they do end up – shooting on their orders. And this is from an account of the terrific and fatal riot at the New York Astor Place Opera House. At last, the awful word was given to fire. There was a gleam of sulfurous light, a sharp, quick rattle, and here and there in the crowd, a man sunk upon the pavement with a deep groan or a death rattle. So by the third volley or so, the bystanders had dispersed. And by the fourth, the shooting seems pretty much unnecessary. So they stopped. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, most people consider the fourth round was uncalled for. Um, But at the end of the whole thing, anywhere from 22 to 24 people were dead, depending on which account you look at. And most of them were bystanders, young working men with Irish last names. Approximately 100 people are wounded. A lot of those are the soldiers hit by stones. And, um, you know, this rage about the whole thing continues for a little while. There are bonfires the next day to protest the massacre. Um, Eventually, though, the tension started to die down. And McCready, of course, I mean, he's not about to be lured into a second return. Um, He gets back to England as soon as possible for his farewell tour there. He retired playing Macbeth in 1851 in England, and he died 22 years later. Um, Forrest, though, has kind of a sadder fate, I would say. Yeah, his reputation was seriously damaged after all of this, and especially later when he was best known for this lawsuit he was in with his actress wife. He he sued his wife for divorce on the grounds of adultery, and he ended up losing the case, but he kept appealing it for the next 18 years. So it was kind of the scandal that was in the news, and, and he was kind of almost known for that more than his acting, it seems. Well, and I mean, he was known for these two scandals, mm-hmm. two very, apparently very big scandals in the 19th century, and his name is attached to both of them, maybe a little too much press. Um, and according to Encyclopedia Britannica, Forrest spent his later years in, quote, his gloomy Philadelphia mansion, and he died only a few months before McCready. Um, But kind of a final note on this whole thing, if you're going to look at the broader history of theatrical riots, there's a really great website called Shakespeare in American Life. It's part of the Folger Shakespeare Library, and I used it a lot um, for the ship that Shipwreck That Saved Jamestown episode, too, which was about the Tempest. Um, But it's great. You know, there are placards, pictures of the actors, interviews with experts. Um, And there's also some commentary from Professor Bruce McConaughey, who we mentioned earlier. And um, apparently, theatrical riots had been really common before the Astor Place riot, but they didn't continue too long after it. And part of the reason why is because the municipal police departments got a lot stronger around the middle of the century. And so a riot like this just wasn't allowed to happen. Of course, there's still riots, but riots in um, a setting that should be so controlled just 
didn't happen as much. I think that's a good thing. Yeah, (laughs) I'm glad we can go to the theater in peace these days. Thank you so much for joining us today for this Saturday Classic. If you have heard any kind of email address or maybe a Facebook URL during the course of the episode, that might be obsolete. It might be doubly obsolete because we have changed our email address again. You can now reach us at historypodcasts at iheartradio.com and we're all over social media at Missed in History. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.